Welcome to the Protein MB podcast. I'm Jordan Sasiwa, and today we have brought in the co chair of the knowledge, information and knowledge acquisition pillar. This is an exciting one for us. I, I was debating how deep into Dr. James House's uh, background I wanted to go. So I'm going to keep it short because I know, I know, Jim, I know if I brag about you too much, you're going to just cut me off anyway. So here's, here's what we've got. The big one, the most recent is the Manitoba Strategic uh, Research Chair in Sustainable Protein. That's going to be the focus of a lot of what we're talking about because it is exciting for Manitoba. Two, most recent, uh, the recipient of the Canadian Nutrition Society's Earl Willard McHenry Award. It's for distinguished service and very, very earned. This is an internationally recognized uh, award that, that our Canadian National uh, Nutrition Society puts out and, and it, it recognizes full careers. And even though we're, we're a long way from being over in this career, it has been great so far, including, and this was, this is my favorite uh, Dr. House, this is my favorite stat about you and the work you've done is over 40 grad uh, grad students that you've worked with and, and, and mentored and coached in this in this protein field, 15 postdoctoral fellow, fellows and over 40 undergrad research assistants. That education piece, um, I think I don't think there's anything more wonderful in this world than, than someone that can learn something and then pass it along. So I've pumped your tires enough. <laughs> um, let's jump right into this and I'm gonna let you chat about this Manitoba Strategic Research Chair and, and what it means to the province and yourself. Well, well, great, uh, thanks Jordan and thanks for, uh, for providing me the opportunity to, to come visit with you today and to chat a little bit about all things protein. And so um, certainly the Manitoba Strategic Research Chair in Sustainable Protein was uh, something that came out of the Manitoba uh, Protein Research Strategy, which was funded by the government of Manitoba um, starting back in 2021 and recognizing that uh, there was an opportunity to create a chair position uh, that really served not only to generate new knowledge, which is what we as academics and researchers you know, strive for and in terms of generating new knowledge and training. As you mentioned, training has been at the forefront of, of my program since, uh, since I started though, oh, 25 years ago or so <laughs> as uh, back at the University of Manitoba. Um, but also extending that knowledge to, uh, to various knowledge users. And I think that's a really important component uh, of what we're hoping to do with the chair position. It's not just about publishing another paper in a, an academic journal, which some folks may or may not see. It's, those are critical, those are important. Uh, you can't uh, discount the, um, uh, the value of those because it does play an important role in providing other researchers and the research community with, with information and uh, as we move uh, the protein, the sustainable protein forward. Uh, but it's also about putting messages together for, um, uh, for sort of the non-scientific uh, community, those end users that uh, can use the data, use the information that you've been generating, and also put your research into practice. Um, so there's several examples of how, uh, that I'm proud of, of, of work that's come out of our lab that has been able to show significant impacts, not uh, beyond sort of, sort of traditional metrics publications, but, you know, in helping to advance specific uh, segments of the, of the of the protein sector forward. Um, and so that's some of the things that we're really excited about and that we hope to continue on with the, uh, with the Manitoba Strategic Protein Research Chair. Well, let's give, let's give an example there uh, of work that has come out of your lab that has really impacted, uh, one impacted profitability, I guess, um, it, the work that you've done with eggs. And, and so this is, it's funny, because as a, as a person that has grown up in Manitoba, and someone that you know played sports and and has been has been concerned with the amount of protein I get in my diet my entire life. Um, the work that has gone on in eggs, when I found out about it, literally just a couple of years ago, I did not realize how much goes into one improving uh, the quality of an egg, including the um, the fats that are in in that egg. But two, and this I guess would be the 
The critical part is so that the end user doesn't say, I don't like this, it doesn't taste like an egg. And, and this has been something that, that your team has done a lot of work in. So if we wanna jump in there as kind of an example of what goes on, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, sure. So when we talk about sustainable protein, we are talking about protein from uh, basically all sources, animal, plants, alternative protein sources. And so working with eggs is just an example of um, sustainable animal protein sources that, uh, that my research program has been involved with. And uh, when I first arrived, uh, my, my original, my first position at the University of Manitoba was in the Department of Animal Science. And so um, I had come from a postdoc position in from Newfoundland and where we had been studying the role that uh, you know certain vitamins play in human health and so uh, we were looking at alternative strategies to enhance the intake of folic acid in the diet uh, it was being added to um, to pastas and breads but for people that uh, at that time all the rage was the Atkins diet and so people were avoiding carbohydrates uh, because they were on the Atkins diet. Well, now it's the keto diet. And so people are avoiding carbohydrates. And those are the vehicles that we've chosen as to carry folic acid into, into the marketplace. And it has an important role in helping to protect moms uh, from having a baby with a neural tube defect. And so, you know, we looked and we, so we did a lot of original work on studying how to enrich eggs with folate and folic acid. And, um, so I'm proud of that work and it's, it's influenced how much the, and, and it's simply by increasing the level of that vitamin within the laying hen diet and you can find the, 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 the point at which you can see enrichment in the eggs. And so we did a lot of that work, characterized it and determined how bioavailable that folate was. And so proud of that work. And then you mentioned the work on fatty acids, like omega-3 fatty acids. That's been the primary focus uh, in our egg nutrition work for about the past eight years is looking at how different fatty acids can play a role in not only the, the um, in meeting consumer intakes for uh, like the omega-3 fats um, but as you mentioned as you do that you want to make sure that you're not turning an egg into a fish uh, we don't want eggs if, if you want a fish experience have fish but uh, if you if I don't think most people are looking for that fish experience when they're having when they're consuming eggs and so we did lots of sensory work to determine um, optimal levels of fatty acids uh, from different sources in terms of how we can uh, get omega-3 enriched eggs and then most recently it's been to turn our attention to not only to the human consumer but to the original consumer of those of the diets that are enriched in omega-3s which is the laying hen and also the immature birds that will become the mature laying hens because now we're interested in understanding well does the, do the omega-3 fats that we're providing in the diet have a health benefit for the birds themselves and so that's been our most recent work and so we're carrying that on to, to look at the role that um, omega-3 fats can play in helping to um, make birds a little bit more resilient to immune challenges and perhaps even enhance their ability to mount a response to specific vaccines. And so that's, that's an area that our research is involved in right now. And, and what was fascinating about what you just did there is you just walked us through how science works, right? It is, it is, it is, we do a study, we find something, and then we, we see where we can go with that. So let's say I'm, I'm a, I'm a young student listening in. How do I get involved in programs like yours? Is it like, if you were going to encourage the next generation of aspiring researchers to get in and, and, and hopefully get involved in the research chair program, um, one, I guess, visiting the website. Uh, and we're going to be putting that 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 site up in, in all the stuff that we do because we're we're as excited as you about this uh, protein chair being here. But how would a young student go about getting involved and, and finding their path to get involved with you? Sure. So there's it, it can happen at multiple levels. Like for example, the um, if you're a, a high school student and you're interested in gaining some experience as a volunteer basis, you can come and you can volunteer within the lab. Uh, we can give you an overview of some of the research. You can help uh, 
uh, some of the researchers that um, that I have in my team or that are present within uh, other um, other programs within our department or within our faculty. And so um, we do have opportunities for high school students to do uh, to, to spend some time um, to maybe doing a science fair project. And I've had a number of students that have done science fair projects um, through um, through the medical the science um, fair program. I've, the names changed a little bit over the last couple of years, but you know, as as we as we get post COVID, I think uh, those opportunities are going to come back. And I think that's if you're if you're interested in science, I think that that's the key thing that I, the, a key message is that you know, food science and nutrition science are just that sciences. And so it's a it's a way of, of having of taking your your interest in the scientific method and and laboratory skills and applying it for specific conditions that are really, you know, that resonate with everybody because we all eat and we all, uh, and, and I think we all recognize that relationship between food and health. And so this is an area that I think uh, that's one way that folks, that students can get involved. At the undergraduate level, um, we have students all the time that come into our program as either co-op students. And so they'll come through a co-op program, a formal co-op program, um, either through the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences or through the Faculty of Science, for example, we'll take students within my lab for a four-month co-op work term. And they'll get uh, experience working on various different techniques within the lab that, uh, that we have in play. Now, uh, beyond sort of the co-op, then you can also, students can also apply for summer research positions. And there is funding available um, through NSERC, which is a major, what we call a tri-council funding agency in Canada that you can apply for a, um, an undergraduate student research assistant uh, award. And um, that's, that can fund uh, research opportunities. And it looks great on a CV. It can set the, set the students up uh, um, for opportunities even further into the future. And then the other uh, way is to, we also have a program that's funded through our our VP of uh, Research and International, and it's our Undergraduate Research Assistant, our URA uh, program, which also provides resources to support summer uh, research positions for undergraduate students. And so co-op and then the two research awards. And then oftentimes people have funding for uh, for their program outside of those programs. And so they can if, uh, just pay attention to um, to research positions that might be posted on uh, UM careers. And the best way to do it is just to, to make sure that you're, you're visible or that you're communicating and you're talking with folks within, uh, within the department, within the various research centers that we have affiliated with the faculty and within the Department of Hum Food and Human Nutritional Sciences. And so by making those connections, um, if opportunities come up, They'll be the first to. Uh, you generally can uh, can create uh, your own pathway forward from that perspective. I love. It. I hear. I hear that, and I've heard from a, a bunch of researchers that we've kind of brought on to this. Is that you've got to be entrepreneurial if you want to take this this research thing to the to to its full potential. And 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 again, you touched on it there and just briefly went over it. But this this stuff in the research and. I've heard it said a few times that I am loving this term, uh, protein agnostic. Um, and that's something that I, I had never heard until meeting a whole bunch of people that are working in the protein industry. Uh, but this is something I think that's fascinating is one, uh, the, the world is the population growth that we have is, is at a point where I don't want to say we need to be creative to feed everybody, but we do need to be making sure that um, research is being done to ensure high quality protein and food is getting to the masses. So from that, from that protein agnostic perspective, uh, what are we seeing here in Manitoba in the, in the research chair that, that you guys are going to be doing as a team? Sure. So when I use that term, essentially it, it's a reflection that, um, Protein is a nutrient and we can derive high quality protein from animal sources as well as plant-based sources and alternative sources such as products from fermentation, um, 
products that are coming from non-traditional, at least from a Western uh, or from a Canadian or North American perspective, that's non-traditional like insects or, uh, or, or fungi. Uh, so these are opportunities that we can derive protein sources. And so uh, the research chair position is looking at both animal and plant-based proteins as well as uh, alternative uh, fungal proteins. And so an understanding the factors that influence the quality of, of those proteins. So, so their um, processing is a big, a big area of studies, how it can influence the composition of the, of the protein and the digestibility of the protein. Um, we're also interested in knowing about how we can create unique blends of, uh, of proteins where, um, where perhaps you're, you're blending plant and animal protein sources together. And so there's some examples of products that have hit the marketplace uh, that do just that. And I think there is, there, there is opportunities there. There's still some regulatory pieces because originally when, when a lot of that was being developed, it was, uh, um, they were trying to avoid uh, putting plant-based products into animal-based products because then it was viewed as being adulteration of the, of the hamburger using cheap plant sources. But that's really not the case now. Now we need to make sure that the regulatory framework is such a way that, uh, you know, if people want to consume um, a blend of say pulses and, and, and burger or pulses and, and other meat sources that they can do that. Or maybe that we're including um, plant or alternative proteins in our dairy products to create blends. Because I think there's an opportunity there when we talk about not only the healthfulness of the product, um, we, can have a, we can have a say in terms of how we modify the plant to make them appealing to the consumer. Um, but you can also modify the environmental footprint of the final product by including, if you're including say 50% plant-based source you into a food that might have a higher um, environmental footprint or more carbon dioxide um, or greenhouse gas emissions, um, by nature, the final product will have a lower footprint because, because of the, the, the concept of blending. And so that's a way to, um, to look at strategies to reduce the overall uh, uh, environmental footprint and improve the sustainability of the protein food system. So that's one area that I think we're interested in, in, in looking at. Um, but I think anything that we can do from a regulatory standpoint is important to ensure that consumers are getting important messaging around protein and sources of protein within, within our diets. So as we're talking about all this great work that's going on, I think, I think we'd uh, be amiss to not, to not put it out now, the CAFA map. Now, I'm not going to even pretend to know <laughs> all the ins and outs of this, so I'm going to let you go. All, all I do know is that I got an email from Myrna saying that I got to make a really good video to make sure that people know that this exists in within the industry. So what are we doing and, and how are we kind of bringing collaboration together with this map? Sure. So the CAFA map is basically a searchable database of research expertise as it relates to sustainable protein and, and protein ingredients. Uh, we started off with funding from Manitoba Agriculture and then subsequently with funding uh, from Protein Industries Canada to establish the map uh, first in Manitoba and now we're spreading it uh, nationally. Uh, and this, this can also, because it's, a, it's an online fillable uh, uh, database, it can go globally uh, as well. So the goal is to make sure that we highlight who's doing what who has the capacity, who, uh, what research interests do we have um, so that folks can search on it on using keywords and also um, identify within a region who's doing work in a particular area as it relates to research. And it's, it, it has a very strong research focus to it. That's one aspect of the CAFA map. There are other elements to it. Like there's, there's another whole database that talks about digital agriculture resources as well. Um, but from our perspective, underneath the umbrella of the CAFA map, when you can find it at CAFAMAP.ca, under that umbrella, there is the Sustainable Protein Research uh, Network, which is really uh, what our focus was and, and what we were developing. And so in there, you'll find researchers, you'll find academics, you'll find uh, uh, research institutes, uh, the, the, human, the human capacity, as well as the, uh, 
uh, as the infrastructure that that's there to help uh, um, establish new collaborations and move the ecosystem forward. No, and I and I love hearing this because just seeing the teamwork on the, on that national and like you say the potential for international scale um, to start solving these problems, creating these more sustainable answers as a as a consumer. There's nothing more exciting than, than knowing that the progression is to high quality protein that is that's going to be healthy for me and it's sustainable and it's it's you know seeing that it is a priority at the at the research level that's exciting to me as a consumer. Now, with that said, the last little bit we're going to get into here is is where you're excited and what you see coming down the pipe. Um, that keeps you in the industry and keeps you in the business and going to work every day. So what's, what's got you? Uh, but sure. So there's lots of things that I'm really excited about. Um, the, the new, the new researchers that have entered into this area, bringing their expertise. I think it's been a pleasure to, to collaborate with uh, a number of them, both here at the university of Manitoba and elsewhere across the, the country and, and also internationally. Um, to work with these collaborators and to identify opportunities to advance, at least from our perspective, advance protein quality, which is really uh, the nutritional attributes of, of sustainable protein foods. Um, and so there I work with plant breeders, I work with uh, um, food processors, I work with um, you know, the uh, agronomists to try to understand all of the factors that can influence the 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 quality of proteins to help advance the sectors. And so if you're working with a breeder, for example, developing rapid assessment tools that they can use to help in their breeding programs. And that's, that excites me in looking for new infrastructure and new, and, and new techniques to do that uh, rapidly and with higher accuracy, I think is something that, uh, that excites me. Uh, the new tools that are coming in to, uh, from a processing standpoint that uh, may find their way into, uh, into commercial production having an understanding of how we can modify the functionality and the quality of protein so that uh, they're better suited for certain applications within the food sector. Um, yeah, and I think just an overall understanding of the role that dietary protein plays in both in human health, but also in the health of animals as well. I think it's uh, the, the traditionally livestock production has been one way that we can manage the uh, the co-products that are generated from a lot of our uh, protein-based ingredients that are being generated. And so that still remains a very significant part of co-product utilization, but there's a lot of exciting work that's being done now to develop even higher value-added uh, products that are being derived from, uh, from these co-products. And so looking at bioplastics or uh, new, using, um, uh, using the co-products as uh, substrates for precision fermentation. So uh, to develop new proteins, new starches, you, you name it. it, it it's, uh, it, it's open to the imagination what can be produced through, um, through these techniques. And so that's what excites me. I love it. The future is bright, not only in Manitoba, but worldwide. And, and, you know, just hearing you talk, I'm excited to see where Manitoba lands in the protein market on a, on a global scale. Congratulations once again to you and your entire team. Uh, we can't stress it enough that Manitoba Strategic Research Chair in Sustainable Protein was a, an incredible co accomplishment, not only for your team, but, but for the province itself. And uh, again, we appreciate you being a co-chair for us at Protein MB and, and, and uh, lending your expertise there. Much appreciate you being on the podcast and we look forward to having you again soon. Great, great. Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate it. You bet.